you will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Borgheimer Language Courses. How may I help you? Oh, yes. I contacted you some time ago about following a German course in Germany, and you advised me to take your placement test before we go any further. Well, I've done that now, so I'd like to go ahead with booking the course for this summer, if that's possible. Certainly, sir. You said you took the placement test. What was the result? I was placed at the O3 level. O3. Right. That's lower intermediate. Fine, Mr... The answer is level 3 or lower intermediate. So the course level has been filled in for you. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Pettersen. John Pettersen. Could you spell that for me, please, Mr. Pettersen? P E double T E R double S O N. That's a double T and a double S. Am I right? That's right. Now, could I ask you where the course takes place? Well, we offer courses in Hamburg and Berlin. For your level, there's never a problem. There are always plenty of people for the intermediate classes. Oh dear. Does that mean that there might be a lot of students in my class? I wouldn't be very happy about that. No, don't worry, Mr Pettersen. The maximum class size is 12, but I've never known there to be more than 9 or 10 in a class. It could even be 5 or 6. Good. Actually, I'd prefer to study in Berlin. And how long is the course? Three weeks, five hours a day. Two hours only on Saturday. Sundays free. I see. And what about accommodation? There you have a choice, Mr Pettersen. You can either stay with a German family who are used to having such guests, or you can stay on the university campus, or we can book you into a nearby bed and breakfast. Is there a big difference in price? Not really. Staying with the family works out the cheapest and the bed and breakfast is a bit more money. Staying on the university campus comes somewhere between the two price-wise, but Berlin is not too expensive anyway. Which do you recommend? Well, if you want to practice your German and be part of a German family, I would recommend staying with a family. Our families are all hand-picked, and we've never had any sort of complaint. Yes, I'll probably do that then. What are the dates of the course? The first summer course starts on the 1st of June in Hamburg and a week later in Berlin, which is what would concern you as you have chosen the Berlin course. That's the 8th of June. The next course would begin on the 2nd of July and then... The 2nd of July course would be perfect for me. Can you put me down for it now? Certainly, Mr Pettersen. Can I have your address, please? 26 Mayfield Drive, Orpington, Kent. I'm afraid I can't remember the postal code. Don't worry, Mr Pettersen. I'll check on it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. There are a couple of other things I'd like to ask. Certainly. What do I need to bring on the course? Well, apart from the obvious, you'll need our textbooks. 
I'll email you the name and publisher. You should be able to find it in your local bookstore. If you do have problems, call me or email me and I'll see what I can do. We provide the computers, computer disks, translation exercises and all that sort of thing, but you will need a good dictionary. We recommend Langenscheid, which is more than adequate for your level. You don't have to go and spend a lot of money on an expensive dictionary. Not yet, anyway. Maybe you will when your German reaches a very high standard. That would be very nice. <laughs> Now, finally, what about the cost of the course? And how do I pay? Would you like to pay that in pounds or in euros? Euros would be fine. In that case, it's 550 euros. You can pay by credit card if you like. Oh dear, I'm afraid I haven't got a credit card. How else can I pay? That's not a problem, Mr. Pettersen. You can pay by bank transfer. Fine. By the way, I forgot to mention I am a full time student. Have you got a student card? Oh, yes. Then that does make a difference, you'll be pleased to hear. You are entitled to 35% off the full price. And if you can persuade a few people to join you, it would work out even cheaper. How do you mean exactly? Well, for every five people you find, one goes free. In other words, if there are six of you, you get one free course. Of course, in reality, you would divide up the savings amongst you, presumably. Right. Well, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Thank you. Not at all, Mr. Pettersen, and I'm sure you'll enjoy the course. There are, of course, sightseeing possibilities. Would you like me to send you our brochure describing them? Yes, thank you. I'd appreciate that. Anyway, thanks for your help. If I want to call back, who do I ask for? Susanna. I'm here most of the time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a university administrator telling a group of new students about the central campus buildings and the facilities they provide. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome everyone to the Brandon Complex, the geographical and, we could say, spiritual heart of this university. This is basically where everyone eats too, as you can see by looking around. There are many different cuisines here, Chinese, Indian and Middle Eastern, plus the usual fare of a local type, all in that corner over there. We have many shops here too, but the biggest is Wilson's, right there, providing clothing and hardware. That's next to all the restaurants. Now, on the opposite side of Wilson's we have three shops. The one in the corner there, closest to the restaurants, is for DVDs. Yes, the DVDs are cheap and affordable, and you can also rent DVD players as well. Moving on. 
In the corner directly opposite Wilson's is the Student Union office. Incidentally, you are all encouraged to join the Student Union, as a Student Union card gives you many benefits, including discounts on basically everything you can buy here at the Brandon Complex. Outside this complex, on the other side of the road, you can just see it from here in fact, is a building that we call by the rather unusual name, the H Building. Next to this, on the other side of some trees along the main road, is the Engineering Institute, but that doesn't have anything to do with the Brandon Complex. One last thing is that just outside this door, near us here, you can see a grassy oval patch, well, that's the playing field for what we simply call the fitness room, which is alongside. So you can put on some calories here at the restaurants and then burn them off at the fitness room afterwards. Oh, I forgot to mention this shop right here, in the middle, beside the student union. It's the bookshop. And, as you can see, it's always busy, always popular. You can buy newspapers, magazines and stationery there, plus a few clothing items as well, just as you can at Wilson's. Why don't you go and take a look right now? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now, I'd like to tell you a bit more about one of the buildings here, namely the H Building. Despite its bland name, you might be interested in what goes on there. It is our main recreational centre, with halls, offices and space available for a variety of activities, mostly for those who want to get fit. For example, if you're interested in yoga, you're in luck, since four days a week there are free yoga classes. They have several levels, so if you're a beginner, you'd have to start with that. You can check the schedules on the wall there. Yoga used to be at night, but now it's in the mornings, but not on Wednesdays. Along those same lines, there's aerobic dancing in the afternoon. This shares the same room as the badminton games, which are on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. The aerobics are on the alternate days, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and it's not restricted at all. Everyone is welcome to join, although the instructor may divide you up, of course, according to ability. And, just to show how diverse the H building is, there's even some spiritual solace available there inside the multi-denominational prayer center, with individual booths and a variety of holy scriptures and texts available to read from all the major religions of the world. That's open all day over the weekend, but not at night time when the rooms are for private booking. Finally, for those of you of a cerebral nature, the University Chess Club operates at night. That's open from 8 p.m. every... Uh, is it Wednesday or Monday? No, sorry, Friday. And I think it closes at about 11.30 p.m. So, there's something for everyone in the H building. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. 
You will hear two friends discussing what to study at Mitchford University. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hello, Gloria. Hi, Paul. I just heard that you're studying psychology this year. At the moment, that's true. But to be honest, I'm not sure exactly what to study. You're in your third year at university. Do you have any advice for me? Well, it's a difficult question for me to answer, but I do have some ideas based upon my personal experience that may be of help. Anything would be helpful at this point. I'm feeling a little worried about what I should do. Well, there are a few things that I would recommend. Firstly, ask yourself, what do you really enjoy studying? For example, maths, English, science? This will help you decide what course you should do. The university handbook lists all the courses available. You should take some time to look at it. A couple of my friends spoke with recent graduates of courses which took up a lot of time. Another thing which took a lot of time was an interview at the Dean of Academic Affairs office. They're always so busy there. Unless you've got a lot of time, I wouldn't bother with either of those ideas. Okay. Gloria, I understand there are some excellent publications that I can look at which will help answer my questions. But the trouble is, I'm having a real hard time locating them. Do you know where I might be able to go? Yes, I encountered this very same problem when I was deciding on what to study. I managed to locate a few excellent books that really helped me to decide what was best for me. Now some of the details will be a little inaccurate. That's no problem. If you could just remember the titles, I'll be able to look them up at the university library. Now, let me just get my pen. Uh, okay, ready? All right. The first book I found was What Should I Do? It was written by Paul Smith, and I believe it was published in 2000 by Smith Brothers. I think this was the best book I read, although Judy Newton's Choosing University Courses was also an excellent help for me. Can you remember what year that one was published? Hmm, let me see. Most of the books I read were published around the same year, 2000, I think. I can't remember who published it. I think it was Printers Limited. You'll have to check that one out yourself. No problem. This is just what I've been looking for. Anything else you could recommend? Yes. There was one other book which I remember because my cousin works for the publishers Brown and Tate. He started there in 2002. Anyway, the book's called Surviving University and was written by Julie White. It's an excellent book which came out in 2004. I certainly recommend it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. Gloria, this discussion has been so helpful. I wonder if I might ask one more question. Sure. What would you like to know? Well, I'm wondering why you finally decided to study psychology. Well, what helped me to decide was my interest in working with people. I think that's what you've got to really decide in your own mind. Do people give you energy or do they drain you of energy? I asked my friends what they thought of my idea, and most of them thought it was a good choice. Yeah, you know, I think my parents or family members who know me well would be a good place to start. Mm. I think if you like to research subjects, you might prefer to work by yourself. That could help you to decide what area you should study. For me, I like working with numbers, and I knew psychology involved a lot of this, so that also helped me to choose my course of study. The bottom line is you've really got to know what you naturally like to do. Once you work that out, you simply choose areas of study that relate to those things. Well, Gloria, I can't thank you enough for your time. Would you be interested in joining me for a coffee?
That is the end of part 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 4 You will hear a woman giving a talk at a popular science convention. She is describing research into artificial gills designed to enable humans to breathe underwater. Now you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. In my talk today, I'll be exploring the idea of artificial gills. I'll start by introducing the concept, giving some background and so forth, and then I'll go on to explain the technological applications, including a short, very simple experiment I conducted. Starting with the background. As everyone knows, all living creatures need oxygen to live. Mammals take in oxygen from the atmosphere by using their lungs, and fishes take oxygen from water by means of their gills, which of course, in most fishes, are located either side of their head. But human beings have always dreamt of being able to swim underwater like the fishes, breathing without the help of oxygen tanks. I don't know whether any of you have done any scuba diving, but it's a real pain having to use all that equipment. You need special training, and it's generally agreed that tanks are too heavy and big to enable most people to move and work comfortably underwater. So scientists are trying a different tack. Rather than humans carrying an oxygen supply as they go underwater, wouldn't it be possible to extract oxygen in situ that is, directly from the water, while swimming. In the 1960s, the famous underwater explorer Jacques Cousteau, for example, predicted that one day surgery could be used to equip humans with gills. He believed our lungs could be bypassed and we would learn to live underwater just as naturally as we live on land. But of course, most of us would prefer not to go to such extremes. <laughs> I've been looking at some fairly simple technologies developed to extract oxygen from water. Ways to produce a simple, practical artificial gill, enabling humans to live and breathe in water without harm. Now, how scientists and inventors went about this was to look at the way different animals handled this. Fairly obviously, they looked at the way fishes breathe, but also how they move down and float up to the surface using inflatable sacs called swim bladders. Scientists also looked at animals without gills, which use bubbles of air underwater, notably beetles. These insects contrive to stay underwater for long periods by breathing from this bubble, which they hold under their wing cases. By looking at these animal adaptations, inventors began to come up with their own artificial gills. Now, making a crude gill is actually rather easy, more straightforward. You take a watertight box, which is made of a material which is permeable to gas, that is, it allows it to pass through inwards and outwards. You then fill this with air, fix it to the diver's face, and go down underwater. But a crucial factor is 
that the diver has to keep the water moving so that water high in oxygen is always in contact with the gill, so he can't really stay still. And to maximize this contact, it's necessary for your gill to have a big surface area. Different gill designers have addressed this problem in different ways, but many choose to use a network or lattice arrangement of tiny tubes as part of their artificial gills. Then the diver is able to breathe in and out. Oxygen from the water passes through the outer walls of the gill and carbon dioxide is expelled. In a nutshell, that's how the artificial gill works. So, having read about these simple gill mechanisms, I decided to create my own. I followed the procedure I've just described, and it worked pretty well when I tried it out in the swimming pool. I lasted underwater for nearly 40 minutes. However, I've read about other people breathing through their gill for several hours. So the basic idea works well, but the real limitation is that these simple gills don't work as the diver descends to any great depth because the pressure builds and a whole different set of problems are caused by that. Research is being done into how these problems might be overcome, but that's another story, which has to be a subject of another talk. <laughs> Despite this serious limitation, many people have high hopes for the artificial gill, and they think it might have applications beyond simply enabling an individual to stay underwater for a length of time. For example, the same technology might be used to provide oxygen for submarines, enabling them to stay submerged for months on end without resorting to potentially dangerous technologies such as nuclear power. Another idea is to use oxygen derived from the water as energy for fuel cells. These could power machinery underwater, such as robotic devices. So, in my view, this is an area of technology with great potential. Now, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I yes, um... I'm here when you need my voice. I'm here when you need my voice. When you need my voice